Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk. You are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Thursday, March 7th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of setting a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate and dollars. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for March 7th, 2024. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Here. Mayor Kavanaugh. Here. Thank you. Council members Farber. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. And City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. Our item set for public hearing is set public hearing for proposed fiscal year 2025 tax rate and dollars and taxpayer statements. Is there a motion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we set the public hearing. Um, sorry, set the public hearing for March 25th. And uh, receive and file and oh, adopt yes. resolution. Okay. That is correct, yes. That's a, I heard you say all those things. Yes. Receive, receive and file, set the, <laughs> receive and file, adopt the resolution, and set the public hearing for March 25th. Second by Wethel. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Sprank, second by Ms. Wethel. Um, <laughs> You would call the no. We don't do that yet. Let's go to Mike. Make him work. Thank you, um, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. So I am going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and then uh, we have uh, our budget staff here and our Chief Financial Officer tonight to answer any questions anybody might have. So the uh, as we put together a are putting together the budget recommendation and reminder that first you have to set the property tax levy before you know what's asked for which of course is absolutely backwards but that's the state law and so that's what you're going to be asked to do tonight but as we put it together as we put together are putting together the budget recommendation and then established what we wanted to recommend for a um, a tax levy we focused on these five things. Uh, this, of course, the city council goals and priorities is the primary thing. And we also looked at, we had some uh, significant needs related to capital improvements in our community, and you'll hear about some of those things, and they'll end up in this budget recommendation. Uh, we are making a strong effort to leverage fate, federal and state grants, because right now, uh, at the federal level, there uh, are a significant number of grants um, through the Biden administration to compete for. Uh, we, of course, public safety and the street program. So the proposed property tax rate that we're going to ask you to adopt tonight is uh, a quarter percent higher than the current year's property tax rate. And this gives you a, a more robust comparison. I just told you the ch change in the rate recommendation. Um, so the property tax asking from the current year to this year would be up about 6% or $1.6 million. Uh, the impact this would have on the average residential property would be a 5% increase in their property tax payment or $40.75. The average commercial property would see over a 25% increase change in their uh, property tax payment or about $850.63. And the average industrial property would see a 3.89% increase in theirs uh, for an average of $187.33. And you'll see why there's such a difference between residential and commercial because the state does what's called a rollback where they uh, have the ability to adjust how much of a residential property is actually subject to property tax and they lowered the amount the percent of a residential property that is subject to uh, property tax which is why uh, you don't see that large of an increase at the residential level so when you compare our property tax rate, to, there's only 11 cities in the state of Iowa with a population greater than 50,000. Now, most of these cities have not yet declared what property tax rate they're gonna hold their public hearing on. 
Um, but the only ones that are even close to Dubuque's property tax rate as far as how low it is, is Ames and Ankeny. And Ames has declared theirs, so we know what theirs is. And while Ankeny hasn't declared theirs, their public information would suggest that it's not going to be lower than Dubuque. So um, the uh, Dubuque's property tax rate will, if you accept this recommendation, we believe, will maintain its status as the lowest property tax rate of the largest cities in the state of Iowa. The city of Waterloo, which has the highest rate, is almost 100% higher than Dubuque's rate. And the average of the other 10 cities, not including Dubuque, would be 53% uh, higher than Dubuque's property tax rate. There's many significant issues that are impacting the budget recommendation. Um, one of them is the increased transparency required by the new state law from last year. So there'll be information submitted to the county auditor and there'll be a mailing to every taxpayer in town uh, during, during this process. The uh, March 25th will be the public hearing on the proposed property tax rate. And um, the meeting has to be separate from any other meeting, so it can't just be on a regularly scheduled city council meeting. And remember, whatever rate you set tonight, you when you have the public hearing and you actually have to adopt the rate, you can't go higher. You can go lower. So if you decide after whatever input you get or other considerations you give by the time you hold the public hearing, if you think, well, you want you don't want it to be as high as you as you set today. So for instance, let's say you accept the recommendation tonight to set the public hearing on the rate that I'm recommending, you still at the public hearing would have the option to lower it, but you can't raise it. Then the state of Iowa, I'll say attempted to give us more time to do our process. And they said, instead of the end of March, we're gonna give you till the end of April to do your budget process only uh, they only give us till April 15th if you have a debt levy. And I'll just tell you, most, well, every large city has a debt levy and lots of small cities. So the real new date is April 15th. It's not April 30th. So it is two week extension over what it used to be. So my, another significant issue is uh, you'll remember that um, when the state of Iowa change the property tax system for commercial industrial property several years ago. They said, we're gonna backfill any losses that cities and counties and school districts receive from the change in the way property taxes were calculated for commercial and industrial properties. Then they changed their mind and they said, no, we're gonna take away that backfill. So uh, when you look at fiscal year 25, uh, our, our loss will be $577,000. Um, so uh, while it's incrementally happens over time, it, it is that much less that we'll have than if they had continued the backfill. And this, as I said, has happened over time. So you can see that uh, when they used to provide the backfill, it was about $1.8 million a year that the city of Dubuque received. And if you, you can see it's taken a stair step down, mostly starting in 2019. And uh, we're in the, the budget year we're dealing with in this hearing is fiscal year 2025. And you can see it's stepped way down uh, from the, the highs of 2016, 2017. And it's gonna continue to do that until 2030 when there'll be no backfill at all. Then also uh, several years ago when the state did property tax reform as they called it, um, and they made those changes to commercial industrial properties which they backfilled the, the losses for a while. They also uh, changed multi-residential properties. So that was a three flat and above. A multi-residential used to be commercial property and was, and was uh, taxed at the same rate as commercial property. They changed that and created this new designation, multi-residential. And they also 
started on an annual basis reducing the amount of the multi-residential property that was subject to property tax. And so you can see, and by the way, did not provide any backfill payments for this. This was just an absolute loss to the city. And you can see that in the first year, the city lost, what, almost $400,000. Um, and uh, fiscal year 21, lost almost a million dollars from that uh, as they kept continued to tax less of the multi-residential property value. And uh, in fiscal year 24, which is the year we're in today, uh, we lost uh, $1.2 million in revenues from what we would have received under the old property tax system for multi-residential. And they then said, okay, now we're gonna eliminate multi-residential, call it residential, and remember, as I opened these remarks with, they uh, change the value each year of how much of the residential property is subject to property tax. And this year it went way down. So uh, now that they eliminated multi-residential, uh, all, all apartment buildings are considered just like anybody else's residence as far as taxes, which means they're subject to the rollback which means much, much less, under 50% of their value is subject to property tax. So you can see from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 24, the city of Dubuque lost $5.6 million in property tax revenue because of this change. And now the change is permanent. So we'll just continue to not receive those dollars. The State of Iowa also increased the homestead exemption, or I'm sorry, created the homestead exemption for 65 people who are 65 years old and older. Uh, FY24 was the first year of that. We're estimating in FY25, it's gonna cost the city $113,000 in lost property taxes. The state also increased the military credit exemption and while they do uh, re reimburse the city just like the homestead credit for the base value of the loss, the increased uh, value of the loss from last year's um, change in the law, they don't reimburse the city. So we'll lose $77,000 in property taxes in fiscal year 25. And, and Jennifer, was that an accurate description? No, it wasn't. So <laughs> you wanna step up to the microphone and give them the accurate description? <laughs> Jennifer Larson, Chief Financial Officer. So the state actually changed the military credit to an exemption, so they aren't actually funding it at all anymore. It will actually reduce the city's taxable value and reduce our property tax revenue by the, sorry, 70, I think it was 79, oh, it's on the screen, 76,918. And then I'm gonna go back and clarify one other item on the commercial and industrial backfill. There were actually two separate items on that slide. The first slide was related to the 90% backfill, which um, is being phased out. The second bullet is related to the new backfill, which the state is funding. So there is actually a two-tier assessment now on commercial and industrial. The first 150,000 uh, value of commercial and industrial uh, uses a residential rollback, and then the state is backfilling the loss of property taxes there. So that's what the $577,000 um, is related to. So that's what we'll be re uh, receiving from the state for that two-tier uh, assessment on the first 150,000 rolled back to the residential. Thanks, Jennifer, yep. and feel free to just jump up to the microphone at any point in time <laughs> when I'm stepping all over it. Yeah. So um, the through the assessment process, through the city assessor, um, the average residential property value increased over 23% and the average commercial property value increased 25%. Now remember, though, the average residential property tax is not increasing 23% because of the rollback factor. So the state adjusted for residential property how much of the property value is actually subject to the tax. They reduced it 
to make up for so that there, there wasn't this shock uh, to residential property. Oh, and here you go right here. So they, uh, in the current year, uh, almost 55% of a residential property value is taxed. And in FY25, it'll be just over 46%. So that's how much they reduced uh, the amount of the value of a residential unit is subject to property tax. And then Jennifer already explained that second bullet there. Thank goodness. Um, we have other revenues besides property taxes uh, that relate to the general fund. So we have riverfront leases. So uh, in FY25, we're projecting we'll get just over $4 million in riverfront leases, which is about a $212,000 increase from the current year. And that's based on the fact that um, all the tenants in the industrial riverfront have long-term leases and they have uh, cost of living increases built into the long-term leases. Local option sales tax, uh, a tax the residents passed by referendum. Um, we are seeing a, a healthy increase in uh, revenues from the local option sales tax and we're, I'm for projecting, I would say, um, be a 3% increase. 50% uh, of that goes to property tax relief. 50% uh, goes to capital improvements. 20% for maintenance of city buildings and 30% for street maintenance. The hotel motel tax ever since the pandemic has been doing very well. Um, and we're projecting it's gonna increase about 3% from uh, the current year of almost $3 million to uh, FY25 to almost $3.4 million. You'll recall that in July of 2023, Moody's uh, did a review of our uh, bond rating and Moody's upgraded the city's outstanding general obligation bonds from AA3 to AA2 as well as the outstanding sales tax increment revenue bonds from A2 to A1. And what they said was, notable credit factors include strong financial operations and ample revenue raising flexibility, which resulted in steadily improved available fund balances and cash. The city serves as a regional economic center and its regional economic growth rate has outpaced the nation over the past five years. So we're not yet done um, putting together the capital improvement project budget. So I don't have any uh, definite numbers to give you about that. Um, but what I am gonna do is tell you about some of the projects that are gonna end up in the capital improvement budget. <clears throat> the mayor and city council has uh, done a good job of managing our debt over the years. And uh, in the current fiscal year, uh, so there's a, there's a, a statutory debt limit in the state of Iowa of how much debt a local government can issue. It can't be any more than 5% of the assessed valuation of the community. And uh, in the current year, uh, we only use 41% of our statutory debt limit, uh, which means there's plenty of room if there were ever to be a crisis or a catastrophe or a need to, to issue debt uh, to deal with some issue is the city of Dubuque has plenty of capacity to do that. And when you look at, uh, remember there's 11 cities in the state of Iowa with population greater than 50,000. So let's see how much of their statutory debt limit they use compared to the city of Dubuque. So of those 11 cities, uh, we have the fourth lowest, I'm sorry, the fifth lowest use of statutory debt limit. And uh, Des Moines, which is, the highest one, their use is 64% higher than us at almost 67% of their statutory debt limit. And uh, Dubuque's is below the average of the other 10 cities. So we compare very favorably on use of debt. And uh, reserves, we have very healthy reserves. So the mayor and city council has a goal of uh, having 25% of general fund reserves. And you can see that in uh, fiscal year 25, so the year we're talking about, we'd have almost 34% uh, general fund reserves. 
Now then, we're, at, we're projecting that in the future years, it will go down closer to the 25% number. And most of that is because, A, we're implementing capital improvement projects with some, some of that money, uh, but some of it has a deadline for expenditure because it was the federal ARPA dollars um, uh, that were released during the pandemic and given to communities across the country, including us. Then um, Moody's, who does our bond ratings, they uh, change the way they uh, analyze communities' reserves. And they now not only consider your general fund reserves, but they also consider your reserves in your enterprise funds. So like sanitary sewer, storm sewer, refuse collection, uh, water. And uh, based on their calculations, and uh, they use the accrual method, um, they say that in FY25, we'll have 35% uh, uh, reserves and that will stay above 30% after that. So uh, that's the projection. So we'll see once we're done with the five-year CIP. So once again, in their eyes, we have very healthy reserves. Um, one of the Marin City Council priorities was that uh, employee retention. So one of the things I'm gonna be recommending in the budget is a 5% increase, uh, wage increase for non-bargaining unit employees. We also have five collective bargaining agreements. We have a tentative agreement with the Police Protective Association at the 5% cost. And uh, we're still negotiating with the Dubuque Professional Firefighters and the International Union of Operating Engineers. So all three of those, their contracts expire June 30th. Uh, we have two Teamster units. Their contracts don't expire till June 30th of 2025. So we're not in negotiations with them. And their contract calls for, in FY25, a 3% uh, wage increase. The estimated cost of these wage increases across the different uh, uh, um, non-bargaining and unions is almost $2 million to the budget. We're also gonna uh, be recommending now in with the materials you received, we sh gave you a list of all the, what's called improvement packages that departments requested. So what do they need new that's not in their budget currently? And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, these are some of the things we're gonna be recommending. Uh, an additional fire captain position to serve in the capacity as a field training officer and safety officer. And the cost of that is uh, 128,000 in FY25. And then a, a new bureau chief position for the, the emergency medical services division and the recurring cost of that is $164,000 a year. So when you look at all the uh, general fund requests for improvement packages, it was $3.2 million. And we were able to identify funding for $888,000 of that. So when you see the recommended ones in that list, uh, that's, that's the ratio. In other words, we weren't even close. Uh, we're at about less than 25% or about 25% of the, of the requests are recommended for funding. Um, I mentioned that we're looking at doing some major capital improvements, even though we haven't completed the capital improvement budget yet to present to you, we will do that soon. Um, but one of the major projects is a $47 million project for the Catfish Creek uh, sewer shed interceptor sanitary sewer improvements. It includes a new lift station, uh, new uh, repla uh, replacement of a significant amount of sewer pipe that was installed in the 1980s, and uh, some new sewer pipe, which would get it all the way to the Southwest Arterial. So that would allow for the Southwest Arterial areas to start being redeveloped by developers. We're looking at uh, implementing at the Water and Resource Recovery Center, a new way to handle the intake of our high strength waste from our major industries. That's uh, over $6 million project. 
We're now meeting with the industries because uh, the fees that we charge for accepting high strength waste will actually be what pays for these improvements. The uh, Water and Resource Recovery Center is gonna up, uh, update their industrial controls for about $3 million. And they're going to do uh, uh, upgrades to their processing uh, facilities for about $1.1 million. Now this is a map that shows you what I just talked about as far as the new, the replacement sewers the uh, lift station and the new sewers that are being put in along the Catfish Creek. And so the purple and the green is, uh, well the purple is replacement of existing sewer and, con and there's some new sewer there and construction of a lift station. The, the green line is a uh, replacement of existing sewer. And then the, all the way on the left, the blue line is a new sewer which will serve the Southwest Arterial Corridor. So this will be not only allow the community and developers to start redeveloping the Southwest Arter or developing the Southwest Arterial Corridor, but it'll uh, eliminate uh, infiltration and inflow problems that we have in this very, very old sewer system. And it also is undersized from what it really needs to be. Uh, and there, you know, there was no way for them to know in the 1980s what kind of businesses or companies would be out here in our industrial parks providing uh, waste and the sizing is not correct. On the Schmidt Island, we're gonna be replacing about and, and putting in some new, um, um, two and a half, about $2.6 million of sanitary sewer as part of the Chaplin Schmidt Island uh, redevelopment project. Once again, back to the Southwest Arterial, but now not sanitary sewer, but water main. We're gonna be recommending spending $1.7 million to extend the water main. So that will also allow for development along the Southwest Arterial. <clears throat> and this is a map that shows that. It shows several other projects that aren't part of this budget. Those are the ones on the left. The one on the right, that purple line that comes up North Cascade Road and goes all the way to the Southwest Arterial, that's the $1.7 million project that I'm referring to. We also are taking advantage of a federal program being administered through the state of Iowa, where uh, we can get a loan, which is almost 50% forgivable, and the rest is very low interest. I think it comes out to about two and three quarter percent when you add the quarter percent fee that we have to pay every year. Um, to uh, finance the replacement of lead water service lines to individual homes. So we've never had a program like this before. We always just deal with the public water mains, but this was a chance to help people uh, in the low income neighborhoods um, replace their service line that is lead. And while having a lead service line in Dubuque is perfectly safe because we add uh, treatment to the water system that makes it so the lead doesn't leach into the water, the absolute preferred methodology is to just replace them. Now, unfortunately in this program, we, I think we've got over 3,300 lead service uh, lines in the city and we're only gonna be able to replace less than 1,000. I think it's about 600. Uh, in this program based on the way the grant works. We're also, uh, you'll remember that last year uh, we tested our water and it showed that we had some PFAS contamination in our shallow wells. Remember our water at the water plant doesn't come from the river. It comes from deep wells and shallow wells and shallow wells are influenced by the river and so in our shallow wells, it turned up we had PFAS. So we've been uh, doing our best to get our water out of our deep wells and just mix in enough water from the shallow wells that keeps us below the standard uh, for the test. Um, but in this, what we're talking about doing is building or digging another deep well. And so we would be able to really rely almost exclusively on our 
deep wells, and, and except for certain times like during the summer when there's really high usage, uh, you know, if it's a dry summer, hot summer, something like that. Um, now, one thing that's not taken into consideration in here is uh, Crenna, City Attorney Crenna Bremwell and the council approved us becoming part of a lawsuit against the companies who uh, products use these PFAS and has created this contamination. And there has been a settlement negotiated, uh, but there's so many cities in the class action lawsuit, it's not been determined yet how much is each, each city going to get. And so this could uh, be, two things could happen here. One, this number could come down as far as how much we have to pay out of our water rates for this specific project, or there are other things we can do from a filtration perspective that when we find out that number, we'll study that first. What should we do? Should we just do this project and pay less out of the water rates, or should we do this project and do more? And so we have less reason to be concerned about the, the influence of PFAS in the future. So that'll be a decision for later. We also are uh, doing some uh, improvements uh, in the third pressure zone, and that's Tanzanite Drive, which is out on Peru Road, uh, and all the way up to Olympic Heights by Highway 52, and that'll be about a $2 million project for the water department. The, uh, I mentioned the, that we're gonna be doing some improvements on Schmidt Island to sanitary sewer for about 2.9 million, and we'll be using about $218,000 of ARPA funds to keep those, uh, the impact on the rates down, the sanitary sewer rates down. And in addition, we're gonna spend about $1.5 million in ARPA money to replace a sanitary sewer lift station at the end of Kerper Boulevard. And that's where the new apartment building is going is being built. And so that's part of our development agreement with that developer is that we'll replace this pump station. It's undersized and it's, and it's it, from a timing perspective, it's ready to be replaced. But instead of uh, putting it on the rates, uh, we're using ARPA dollars to do that. And this is a map that shows those two things I just mentioned. So the red circle on the right is the new lift station or the replacement lift station at the end of Kerper Boulevard. And then the red lines on the left, those are the new sewers and probably an additional lift station on Chaplin Schmidt Island to support all the development, the over $80 million in development that's gonna happen there. Actually, it's almost $100 million in development that's gonna happen there. We'll also be uh, replacing the B Branch gate and pump uh, at the 16th Street Detention Facility. Um, that's a $28 million project, and we're leveraging an $8 million federal grant to help us pay for that. And we have another uh, request in, and hopefully that will happen too, but that hasn't yet, So, but this one has. Uh, we also uh, submitted a raise grant through the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, the, the idea is to build a railroad overpass over 14th Street to improve 16th Street. I'll show you a map in a minute. And Elm Street, the total project cost is $43 million. It will hopefully, we'll find out uh, in a couple of months, will leverage a $25 million grant, raise grant from the federal government uh, we received $9.2 million from DMATS, the local regional transportation organization. And we also have gotten support from the Dubuque Racing Association. So this is a map that shows where those improvements are. So you can see uh, the, I don't know, is that like an aqua line, I think? Uh, they're down in the lower left. That's the railroad overpass. Then you can see on the far left, uh, running from top to bottom, that uh, gold line with the, with the red line on each side of it, that's Elm Street, and that will become a complete street all the way from five points to the Intermodal Transportation Center. So it'll include a really nice bike lane. Uh, 16th Street, which is that purple color in the middle there, running from left to right, 
that will receive the same treatment as Elm Street and become a uh, complete street with bike lane uh, up to Sycamore. And then you can see uh, just north of the 16th Street Detention Facility, there's a orange line. That's the hike bike trail that already exists. And so people will be able to go off the street onto the hike bike trail. Um, there'll be a roundabout. You can see that there uh, in the middle uh, at Sycamore and 16th Street. Uh, that's that circle there in the middle. Um, that would be a roundabout. And then when you get all the way over to the right side of the drawing, there's another roundabout, and that is at Admiral Sheehy Drive and Dubuque Greyhound Drive, where it enters Schmidt Island uh, and where the Wisconsin Bridge lands, traffic lands. That would be another roundabout. And then the uh, bridge that goes over the Piasta Channel now doesn't have a bike lane. It would, you would be adding a hike bike lane to that. This is an artist's rendering of the, of the railroad overpass. And this is an artist's rendering of Elm Street once it's a complete street. Also, uh, from, with leveraging grants uh, on Schmidt Island, uh, we'll be building a $16 million outdoor amphitheater and we were able to get a $3 million grant from the Iowa Economic Development Authority to support that, and also financing from the Buke Racing Association to help support it. Now, this is not a city project, so you won't see it in the budget, but we're in partnership with the Iowa Department of Transportation, and we're advocating for a $17.5 million reconstruction of the intersection of the Northwest Arterial and Highway 20. Part of that reconstruction would close the south leg of that intersection so that the south part of that intersection goes into the, the Walmart area. That part of that intersection would close and then it would just be a three-way intersection, be much more efficient, and there'll be substantial other improvements that will add to that efficiency. Uh, the city and DMATS are kicking in $5.5 million and the idea is the Iowa Department of Transportation will pay the remaining $12 million. And we know in April at the uh, IDOT meeting, the commission is going to consider whether they're going to, what their five-year plan is going to be, and does this make it in? And we're, we're pretty optimistic. Um, this is, uh, well, this is a rendering of that. So you can see the south leg of the intersection is closed and a frontage road is built. You can also see that for westbound traffic on Highway 20 that wants to turn north onto the Northwest Arterial, they no longer would come up to the traffic light. It would actually be an acceleration lane where they would uh, jump off of Highway 20 into this acceleration lane, which would take them onto the Northwest Arterial without ever arriving at the stoplight. And there's also some closures on the north side uh, of Highway 20 west of the Northwest Arterial. So some of those businesses, uh, car dealers who now access Highway 20 would no longer access Highway, I'm sorry, yeah, Highway 20 would no longer access Highway 20. Uh, they would have a frontage road to Old Highway Road. So the, the intersection would become much more efficient, uh, much safer, um, and uh, would really, we think, facilitate the movement of traffic from the south, northwest arterial to the southwest arterial. I mentioned that public safety is one of the important things in this budget, and uh, we'll be uh, spending $3 million to replace the software system that runs everything at the police department, the fire department, and the 911 emergency communication center, the Dubuque County Sheriff's Department, and so on. And this is a, a partnership with the county. So the county will pay 1.5 million and the city will pay 1.5 million. When you look at the investment in the fire department equipment um, and facilities, uh, it's almost $9 million. So there'll be two new fire engines, a new ambulance, a new fire rescue boat, a replacement. And by the way, those are all replacements when I say new. So uh, replacing two fire engines, replacing an existing ambulance, 
and replacing the fire rescue boat. Uh, also be improvements to the fire burn tower. Uh, will be, this is the almost $5 million to at some point in time build a, uh, a future fire station out west. And then there'll be a major remodeling of all the stations of their bunk rooms for about $1.4 million. And I mentioned streets. Well, you've seen a lot of street projects throughout this presentation already, and some of them are mentioned here. Uh, there, of course, will be the five miles of asphalt overlay that our public works crews do. There'll be the 14th Street overpass, associated roundabouts and complete street improvements, the Northwest Arterial and Highway 20, and the Central Avenue corridor streetscape improvements. As the council has always made it easy on us uh, when they adopted this statement of what are we supposed to be trying to accomplish? We're supposed to be trying to create an equitable community of choice, a high performance organization and community that is data driven and outcome focused built on the five pillars of resiliency, sustainability, transparency, equity, and compassion. And how do we do that? Through planning, partnerships, and people. And so you'll be setting the public hearing on the proposed property tax rate. Um, and then there's gonna be public meetings on the budget recommendation on March 26th, March 27th, March 28th, April 2nd, April 4th, April 8th, and April 9th. So plenty of opportunities for residents to get input. The final public hearing will be April 11th. Remember I told you the budget has to be adopted by April 15th by state law. And then here's the sites that people can go to uh, to provide any comment that they'd like to do. And with that, uh, Jennifer Larson, the Chief Financial Officer is here to answer any questions. Well, thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I thought I'd jump in early here just to give a few comments and then uh, obviously leave it open for any other discussion that we want to have. But um, first of all, I, I want to thank Mike as a city manager and of course all the staff because everybody's involved in this process. Um, everybody has uh, their hand in some way in creating this budget as challenging as it really is. So thank you very much for doing all that hard work. I know that we make some tough decisions here, but the real hard work in this budget is done well before it gets to us. Um, well, we knew this would be a challenging budget year ahead, and um, we're definitely seeing that. I'm um, going to give my annual uh, complaint here about the, the barriers that the state legislature puts in front of us, but I, I want to I actually first talk about um, a little bit of the positives that are here in this budget. You know, as difficult as it is, um, this proposed budget really does meet some of the key demands of this next year ahead of us. Uh, first of all, I, I really do think it's in line with the goals and priorities that we set as a city council uh, at the end of last year. We know how challenging that process is in setting those goals and priorities, and we were very focused this year on things like staffing, infrastructure, and some some really key projects that are um, taking place throughout the city, like uh, Chaplin Schmidt Island, um, continuing to focus on Central Avenue and those types of things. Uh, I also think that this is actually uh, very much in line with the needs of Dubuque right now. I mean, Mike, your presentation was was great in showing us some of the ways in which, especially the capital improvement projects, are focused on a lot of the needs that have come up in this past year. But I really do think that this entire budget does its best to uh, be able to focus on the, the needs of the community. And then finally, I think that it's in line with the trends that we're seeing across the state of Iowa. I mean, we, uh, you know, as, as Mike pointed out here in the presentation, we are still the lowest property tax rate, but almost all the property tax rates throughout the state have risen for various different reasons. And, and that's uh, something that I think is important that we look at as we go through this process. There are definitely some challenges and disappointments that are in this budget. And as in most years, there are many, many improvement packages that um, the city manager could not recommend. And as usual, each of these have been requested by city staff for very good reasons. So it's always difficult to see that number that is so large that we aren't able to recommend. Um, but that's one of the challenges of creating a budget in the way that uh, we need to. Uh, here's where I'd like to mention a few of the challenges that I think have been put in our way by the state legislature. So um, I really think the state of 
the state legislature continues to make it more difficult annually to allow cities and towns and counties for that matter across the state of Iowa to provide the services that the Bukers and other Iowans really want. And those things are pretty simple when it comes down to it. We want good roads. We want uh, police, fire, public safety, uh, safe, affordable housing, modern functioning infrastructure, pools, recreation opportunities, and the staffing to make each of those things possible. And I really do hope that in time, our state leaders decide to be a partner in making Dubuque a great place to live rather than putting new and creative barriers in place that make it harder to invest in the places that we call home and the people who live there and the people and places we love. Because that's really what's happening now. So I hope that we get to that point sometime. But I do continue to be frustrated by the many barriers that our state legislature puts in place in this process to make budgeting in cities like ours more difficult. Now, despite all these challenges, we continue to find ways to provide as much responsible investment in the Dubuque community as we can. And that's thanks, to, again, to our innovative and very talented staff. I think it's thanks to the, the sincere fiscal responsibility that we have shown as a city council and previous councils have shown. And it's also thanks to the millions of dollars that are coming from our federal government and that really came in a bipartisan fashion over the last few years and, and from the Biden administration. And then, of course, I want to give some credit where credit is due to some state agencies like the Iowa Economic Development Association and the Department of Transportation and others who do provide us with some assistance. So with all that said, I really carefully reviewed um, everything that we're looking at tonight, and I know we all have. And, and I really do, at this point, support the recommendation that is before us this year. Uh, and I want to thank, again, thank again to the staff and um, everyone for their hard work on this. I think everybody has been very focused on creating an equitable, equitable community of choice, as Mike pointed out. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it open for other discussion, Mr. Mayor, for a time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Who's next? <laughs> Laura. <laughs> Thank you. I think the mayor described the situation very well. I think um, the legislature has added many layers of challenge um, that add complication. As we try to explain the, the process to our citizens, um, the challenges that have been added um, really make that difficult. So I appreciate the way our city manager was able to present um, this overall um, budget to us. Um, I support the tax rate as it is currently presented, and I'm really going to be looking forward to all of the budget presentations um, and focusing in. I, I, I can see that it's focusing in on the priorities that we as a council have established. And so um, I am in support of the tax rate that has been presented to us here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farber. Yes, yeah, so I actually have a question. Um, and I know that, um, Jenny, you said that the um, all of the CIP and all the budgets are not formalized or completed at this point. But just wanted to ask in terms of public safety, and I can't recall um, as we're talking about the IT in particular, in terms of what's happening now in Chavano and the new rollout, what it was that we built into that current budget for <laughs> cybersecurity and for uh, public safety. And um, I bring that to our attention based on what recently just happened uh, with some of the funding in the county kind of being lost in space, um, in cyberspace. So just no. wanted to see if I could be refreshed as to uh, what it is that we have planned for that and do we have ample security for that yeah, funding. Well, uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan, first of all, it wouldn't be fair or appropriate for me to comment on what happened with the county and the city of Dyersville, so I won't. Um, but um, we have a very robust cybersecurity program, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had great success with that. But related to this budget, uh, we're going to be uh, moving our IT department out to the West End uh, in a facility that we're purchasing space in, uh, the, the old Medline building, purchasing the space from uh, uh, Dubuque Initiatives who purchased the building. 
And uh, we will have, I believe it's about a $600,000 budget to do that. So uh, move our servers and all those things out of the basement of the old funeral home downtown and into a nice new well-protected space. Um, we're also spending $3 million to replace all our software systems at police, fire, and 911 emergency communications and our, our ambulance service. And uh, so we believe we'll have the most modern, uh, safe, well-protected software system uh, that you can have. And that's, uh, and so uh, that'll happen over the next year. And um, we did add a cybersecurity position to the city budget last year. And so we have that new position to help us with all our cybersecurity issues. I don't know if uh, Jennifer Larson, if you wanted to add anything, or City Attorney Crenn and Brumwell. Okay, well. That doesn't look like it. So unless you have any more questions no, about No, thank it. you for that refreshing uh, refreshment because I wasn't cognizant of, of all that was occurring. I just think it was important for us to have that. Um, just to be comfortable that it was in the budget or the ongoing. So thank you very much. And um, I agree with everything that has been said as well tonight. And I think, um, Mike, your presentation was spot on and very educational for us to really understand um, the, um, the pros and cons of this budget, which I think is very prudent. I think public safety is really um, there for all of us to see. And I think the uh, CIP projects are uh, basically in line with our goals in terms of the infrastructure. Um, so thank you very much for all of that, Jenny. Thank you for all of your work as well. And um, this is one of the years that I'm just going to be very pleased to support without adding additional funding as a reserve. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wiggle. I just wanted to share today an article uh, titled from the Des Moines Register and a little snippet out of it because I think it um, speaks to the somewhat devastating space that we will be living in in the next few years in trying to care for our city. Um, the article published in Des Moines Register today was Des Moines and other cities say Iowa's tax changes have left budget holes no room for growth. And the Iowa League of Cities director, Alan Kemp, said to the Des Moines Register that cities of all sizes are reporting, quote, a loss or limitation of revenues and revenue options, end quote. Yet cities, quote, face the same inflammatory, I'm sorry, inflationary pressures that everyone in the economy faces. And I think that that's what we have to remember is that we are doing our best and I hope that citizens will recognize that we're doing our best in a setting in which all of our household costs and costs of living have gone up. Um, the costs of running a city are going up. They're going up dramatically. They're going up regarding our own insurance, um, our own day-to-day -day operation costs. And so I intend to be very thoughtful as we move forward, I appreciate all of the city staff's hours of effort that they do as individual departments to prepare us for this. Um, I intend to support the recommendation tonight, but I promise the taxpayers will be as thoughtful as we can, but we must all remember that as much as we want new services and new opportunities for our city, we may be in a place where we have to do um, less than we wanna do this year. Thank you. Mr. Sprank? Um, I was just gonna say, echo a lot of what everyone's already said. I'm mainly thanking the city manager and staff because it's not going to be a fun process this time, but um, we, our hands are sort of tied, shall we say, and uh, this is the best we can do with what we have, so I'm, I understand what it, it is what it is, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I thought coming down here tonight that the appropriate thing would be to adjourn the meeting, then have the meeting, and then call it to order because of the backward nature of the rules that put us here. <laughs> the, the citizens have every right to expect us to make informed decisions based on a lot of information. We're going to have a ton of information coming over the next eight weeks, but we don't have it yet, and we're required to set the budget number tonight without that information, and that angers me every year. Uh, 
I think the number that I last saw is about 80% of the people that live in Iowa live in cities. That's a big deal. So why is the 20% driving all the public policy about how cities operate? That's also a big deal, and one that I, I wish our lawmakers would address and pay a little bit more attention to where the people are and what the people's needs are. Because we're doing the best that we can, and we're the closest to the people of all the elected layers of government that exist. Um, I'm real impressed with, with what's before us tonight, all of that being said. I was prepared a few weeks ago to stick in how I was going to explain the need to do a, a 6 or 8 or 10% tax increase to meet the needs and to compensate for the, for the losses coming from, from state government. And as good luck would have it and great skill in our finance office would have it, and as I misinterpreted some of the things that they had done to us, to be worse than they were, although they're still pretty bad. Um, this budget puts us in a pretty good place where we can impact some public safety issues that, that need work. We're able to impact some salary issues that, that have needed work and become more and more apparent to us. Um, we've got some of the best people in the world working for us. And you see it all the time. Um, the presentation on, on the police annual report the other day. Um, Talk about compassionate, caring law enforcement. Um, it's contrast to just about everything you see on TV, and of course that's contrasted to reality as well. But um, so many cities don't enjoy that. Um, so many cities won't find officers that care at all about um, unhoused persons um, or people people in, in trouble, or even people who are under arrest or have substance abuse issues and are a, a major difficulty for for managing. But the compassion that I see all the time from these officers and the restraint and their leadership in areas like uh, understanding emotional IQ really impresses me. I don't want those guys leaving to go somewhere else. Um, our firefighters are just came through an accreditation process. I had a chance to stop at Station 5 the other day and visit with the guys a little bit and see some of the new technology firsthand and how the, the very first chirp of the radio, they're looking up at the screen and they know if they're going or not and if they're going where they're going. And, it's mapped right on there, and there's screens all over the building, so wherever they're at, they can see that. So they're not even listening for the dispatch. They're reading at the same time the electronic voices. That's pretty impressive. Um, all of the things that everybody in that department had to do to achieve accreditation, pretty amazing. Um, big hurdles, big, big data collection, big data understanding to get there. Um, so we're, we're addressing that. We're, we're getting a little closer to where we need to be on, on wages, and that's a great thing. All in all, this is, uh, I'm delighted to see us only at a quarter percent um, tax increase, tax rate increase. I, I know that the actual impact on citizens is a little bit higher. Um, but please, folks, understand that uh, the same um, issues that are tugging at your budget tug at ours. Um, we can't run police cars and fire trucks without fuel, and fuel costs money, costs real money. Can't light up these buildings without electricity. Um, you want us to have quality employees, and you deserve that level of service that you get from these municipal and professionals. Um, and you need them, and you need us to take care of them and, and do a good job with that. So we hear you. We understand that it's not easy to pay your taxes or to buy your groceries or to fuel your automobiles and all of that. It's not easy for us. In fact, it's a little bit harder because um, infrastructure pieces for us cost more. If you... I was talking to Andy this morning about this, and I came from a medical background. A pair of scissors cost you, you know, three or four bucks at the store. But if it's a medical scissors, 15 or 20 bucks, almost the same thing. Hardly any design difference, hardly any manufacturing difference. Well, golly, how many of you had to buy um, sewer main this year? A chunk of that costs a lot of money. How many of you had to buy a dump truck or a street sweeper? or you just saw ambulances are $400,000, almost a half million dollars for an ambulance. Um, municipal infrastructure pieces are getting really expensive. Um, but we're gonna pull it off with only a quarter of a percent increase in, in our tax rate. And I'm very proud of that and our staff should be too. Jennifer, your, your team is amazing, second to none. <laughs> so nice work. So let's, uh, let's vote on this and adopt that tax rate and this resolution and Probably go home. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? 
Aye. Farber. Aye. All right, that motion passes uh, six to zero. Um, no further business being on the agenda. We'll call this meeting adjourned.